gentlemen, welcome to Amsterdam, welcome to the Netherlands. Please remain seated until the fastest signal sign has been switched off. Attention please. Today's guest is Mike Wellings, co-founder and managing partner of Aquaspark, the first and the largest fund in the world fully dedicated to aquaculture. Hi, Mike. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, David, for having me. Yes. So you are in the Netherlands? Yes, based in Utrecht, um, uh, which is right at the heart of the Netherlands, uh, mm -hmm. in the middle of the country. And um, yes. Yes. It's a nice place to be. Yeah. The, in a, a previous, uh, my career, I was a corporate investment banker. I always feel very, felt curious about Netherlands. The reason is that uh, first I invest very heavily semiconductor equipment. So I financed uh, like uh, uh, international uh, DRAM company like Hynix, Samsung. I found that uh, they uh, uh, purchased the most expensive semiconductor equipment from Netherlands, ASML, right? Yes. Yeah. One yeah. unit very cost, successful company. Yeah. yeah. One unit cost 50 million US dollar. Some other equipment costs 150 million US dollar. So I can imagine it's much more expensive than the, I mean, than gold or jewelry, right? <laughs> It's uh, those machines are very expensive. It's, yeah, super uh, yeah, expensive. Very successful company. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I made uh, some joke. You know, Samsung and Hynix, they have. Uh, I mean, everybody PhD basically. I mean, if you uh, bump into uh, someone on the corridor, he will get. He 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 has a PhD from the internationally famous university or the Asian university, something like that. But they are the, uh, they are doing the cookie cutting, using the SMM machine, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I made a joke about that. And then it's, uh, yeah. uh, as you may know, is uh, like Asian countries, a very, very high uh, ratio of uh, like a university graduate, right? Probably, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure, maybe 80 percent 80 of the young people now graduate from the university. Education is uh, really, really great. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Europe is a uh, graduate of ratio of uh, university graduate uh, quite low, right? It depends on what country you go to. In the Netherlands, uh, it's quite high, actually. I made a silly joke. <laughs> PhD, <laughs> no, a, no. PhD, a lot of PhD is our cookie cutting. Uh, I baked the bread using the machine, very expensive machine uh, made by the university or high school graduate. Something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have also the uh, Dredger company, internationally famous Dredger company, right? Yeah. Jandino yeah. and Boscalis, they, uh, they are making, building the trailing suction hopper dredger, something like an iPhone. Other people yeah. use the uh, picture phone and then the, have some the iPad, I mean, separately, right? In order to dredge, yeah. uh, because I finance them a lot, is in order to uh, dredge in Asia, they're using the body and tug and suction and all separate machine. Then, then the, yeah. they operate together and then uh, work together, but uh, basically is uh, that machine from the Boscalis and Juno is something like iPhone. You have everything in it, right? So, uh, yeah. and then the, uh, for that market, uh, or very dominant player, no other competitor in the world. Yeah. Very few. <laughs> yeah, very yeah. few. Also, yeah. I heard that, that they, uh, they intentionally scrap it when they stop using the old machine in order to, not, uh, in order, uh, to avoid the competitor. If they sell the old machine, may, that may be wrong. I have what I heard from other people in the market yeah. is that the, those players scrap it instead of selling the second hand to the Chinese guy or Asian operator. Yeah, interesting. I've never heard that before. Yeah, yeah. It seems like uh, it seems like I know I know better about the uh, uh, Netherland than you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, Another thing is, uh, you guys uh, sold uh, sold. Uh, what is that? Flower by air, right? That's amazing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I felt that the very different DNA. I mean, the people when people talk about the competitive inside the European country, like France and Italy, they have very, they very what you call creative, and then also they are very good at creating brand, growing the brand, luxury brand, right? So yeah. the other country very difficult to compete with them because they have very good sense in in probably they have a good DNA yeah. for that. But I felt more fascinated about the Netherlands because I cannot say whether it is creativeness or innovative. I don't know what it is, but very unique. 
uh, Dutch. It's, um, I, I don't know. It's a combination of um, being practical, uh, being yeah. inventive, but also um, trading. And we're a very small country, so we've always right. been very dependent on everybody around us and trading right. with everybody around us. Um, and that's really in the DNA of the country. And there's quite right. a bit of um, entrepreneurial spirit. If you look at the agricultural sector. Uh, yes, um, yes, I heard about that too. Yeah, there's a, there's a hydro farming and then the uh, aquaponics. Yeah. But that's also because there's an almost unique ecosystem between government um, educational um, uh, facilities such as agricultural universities, such as Wageningen, for example, um, business um, and, every, and, and, and farming. And everybody works really well together to fix problems. Yeah. That ecosystem is quite unique. And that's something that... I think is part of our culture a little bit. And, and, and some people attribute that to the fact that we always had a country that was below water and we mm -hmm. have to work together. Ah, to yes. the water. You, you, you overcome that situation, right? It's very huge challenge, and, right? And you have to do it together. Right. Because if you, ah, if you don't yes. do it together, makes sense. If you, makes it, sense. If, you, if you do it alone, you still drown. Right. Yeah, that, that's a, uh, one good example to describe how the like a, a business in the Netherlands has evolved and become competitive in a different way, right? Yeah. yeah. Sense that the, the Netherlands has a lot of knowledge export. Yeah. Uh, but aquaculture itself is relatively small in this country. Uh, maybe um, it's a uh, knowledge base, probably knowledge base. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Knowledge, base, knowledge base is really strong, but, um, right. and, um, but most of the... Operation-wise, not that big. That's what I mean. No. Uh, okay. 85 percent is in, is in is in asia so yeah uh, that, really, that is a true yeah. that is a true yeah that yeah. is true uh, even the, the us for example as a continent uh, north america is only one percent of global agriculture it's uh, yes yes it's tiny yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and then i uh, came to learn the, your company uh, uh, aqua spark actually i traveled a long time ago in indonesia when we had uh, some project working with Indonesian yeah. client, I happened to meet with your portfolio company, eFishery. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know how many years ago, five years ago, six years ago, but he, he told me that he, they, he got an investment from you, your company. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I heard about his business model, but I didn't expect that he can grow, uh, he, he could grow that successfully after that, yeah. It's still, uh, it's still early days, but uh, e-fishery is doing really, really well. And uh, yes. I mean, in the sense of there's still so much growth potential ahead. Yes. Uh, Indonesia has, um, what is it, 14 million fish farms. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, just, uh, just ponds, mm -hmm. um, uh, um, um, let alone the rest of um, Asia and, uh, mm -hmm. and the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it's the company really morphed into... A platform that provides financing for farmers, um, feed, um, direct access to um, end markets to sell your products. Um, for a farmer, uh, aside from uh, saving about 25% in feed use and uh, having much better growth and less disease, mm. it's also a, a big financing mechanism. It's a selling mechanism. And for an average pond farmer, it means that their income will double or triple. Yeah. Um, and it costs almost nothing. So Yes, yeah. Uh, we're in, uh, in in tens of thousands of um, uh, of uh, ponds now. Yes. Yeah, we expect that uh, the the goal is to go uh, to a million. Right. Fish farming is in Asia is a big thing. Yeah, I met a lot of large scale fish farming business in Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia. Yeah, yeah. that is true. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about uh, some topic. Yeah, today. Yeah. All right. I uh, look at your profile and then the, some of the. Uh, things are written in the Dutch, so I can I can, could not understand. But looks like you're wearing so many hats, right? Spark, Good Venture, Entrepreneur Roundtable, and uh, Aqua Sparks. So yeah, can but... you can you briefly explain what you are doing with that, all these companies and organization? Yes, well, so um, um, almost all of my time today goes into Aqua Spark, mm -hmm. um, but um, I started. As an entrepreneur, just before I turned 19, and um, in HR 
very mm -hmm. unrelated. Um, and the company that came out of that, I'm still one of the co-founders and uh, co-owners of the company. I'm just not active anymore, mm -hmm. which is a professional employment company here in the Netherlands. Okay. And then along, along the way, I started to invest in all kinds of other things, from uh, bicycle rickshaws in India to financial infrastructure in Northern Africa for people that um, don't have a bank account, software startups in the US. I invested in ERA really early on. Uh, which is one of the uh, uh, New York's uh, most active um, um, uh, accelerator companies um, and started a small, really small family office um, uh, called Ace Park Good Ventures with, uh, with which company I, uh, we made um, uh, most of the investments. And then along the way came across aquaculture. Mm -hmm. which was kind of a coincidence. Like years ago, by coincidence, I got an invite to join National Geographic on an expedition in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And we went to Kiribas, the Southern Line Islands, um, and um, Millennium Atoll. Um, it's uh, on the dateline. Uh, it took um, a week and a half to get there. First, you have to fly to Tahiti, and then it's still uh, four days by boat. So it's uh, really a, a long travel. Nobody lives there. It's uninhabited. And we got off the boat with National Geographic and National Geographic said, well, hey, um, we, would, we, we are going to make a documentary about this unique ecosystem, and, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We are going to write an article in the, in the magazine. Um, but we also are going to try and find somebody that can help us um, turn this into a marine protected area. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, so, you know, I'd love to work on that and see if I can help. Um, which eventually happened, but not thanks to me. But a year later, that work together with National Geographic got me an invite to this floating ocean conference in the Galapagos in Ecuador mm -hmm. um, called Mission Blue, which was organized by TED.com. Um, and um, uh, I went on the boat, which was 100 people for a week, um, uh, um, talk about oceans and, um, uh, and what could everybody commit to uh, try and... Um, uh, uh, um, do better with our oceans and get our oceans to a better place, which was around Sylvia Earle's um, um, wish around hope spots, more marine protected areas, basically. And that's where I met my partner and wife, Amy Novogratz. Um, mm -hmm. And um, we came away from that boat thinking and that conference from, uh, we would love to find something around oceans that we could turn into a real business um, that's around ocean conservation. Um, and we started looking around, and then a few months after that, we got an invite from somebody at Conservation International, and I was part of the leadership council back in the day. Um, and um, uh, we had a small meeting around um, uh, the Ocean Health Index, and um, somebody came and presented around aquaculture. And aquaculture had a really bad reputation in the environmental community. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really expect much of a response. I kind of expected everybody to listen politely and then just forget about it. Yeah. Um, but the opposite happened. And people really started asking questions. And so how can we get involved? And I got really interested um, and surprised and then forgot about it. And then a few months later, the presenter, which is Steve Hall, who now sits on our advisory board and um, at the time was the director general of World Fish based in uh, Penang. Mm -hmm. um, and they are using aquaculture to get uh, to lift people out of poverty um, and around food security issues. I mean, for well, if we can find a way to help world fish, then um, that's um, this is really interesting. Let's uh, start discussing. And after a lot of discussions, that's um, where Aquaspark was born. Because then, then we started looking at investing in aquaculture. We heard that there was very few, very little investment activity in aquaculture. The really big companies publicly listed get a lot of attention, um, but 95% of this industry at the time was um, SME. And a lot of the SMEs are self-financed. There's a lot of family businesses and people finance themselves, but that means that the medium layer is really small. And we were really surprised by that. And then started looking at why and thinking, well, if this sector really needs to grow, then how can we help? And um, yeah. That's what's Aquaspark today. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Uh, I, I know only the company, I only the fund uh, I know uh, is uh, that are engaged in the full time into fishy farming investment is Aquaspark. Spark. So yeah. uh, 
uh, beside the AquaSpark, are there any competitor fund who uh, which are engaged the same investment strategy, fully focused on the fish farming and aquaculture around the world? Um, not really. There are a few other yes. funds that um, have aquaculture as part of their strategy. Yes. Um, and there are a few private equity funds. And there's a fund that um, focuses on aquaculture in uh, publicly listed companies, but not the way we do. And yes, we... Yeah. We, we are also like, it's also good to know at, at, at the, <clears throat> we're not just an investment fund. We happen to be an investment fund because we think that that's the best tool to use. But we have a very specific goal um, uh, where most investment funds are set up because somebody thinks it's a great idea to make an investment fund and to be an investor. Uh, that's the goal. And in our case, that's not the goal. In our case, we said, okay, aquaculture has the potential to be the best food system available to mankind with the yes. healthiest high quality output yes. in terms of um, uh, uh, food. Um, uh, and there's about 700 different species being farmed globally. It's very different from chicken, chicken, and chicken. Yeah. Very diverse, which is incredible and something yes. that we should keep. Um, and at the same time, a lot of those species have a footprint that's incredibly small if you compare it to other food sectors. Um, if you look at seaweed, net positive. If you look at, um, and we, we farm um, Arctic char in Iceland, for example, on land with a completely geothermally powered uh, facility, no antibiotics, no chemicals, and one kilo of feed for one kilo of fish. And the output is higher quality than the input. Um, now, you could talk about the footprint of the feed and saying, well, hey, you need resources to make that feed. So we think we can fix that too. So we said, well, hey, this, this has a potential to be the best food system available to us. It's larger than beef today. It's larger than wild caught fisheries globally. And it needs to double, potentially even triple by mid-century, uh, ideally. Um, it does have issues. We have mangrove um, destruction, bad sighting, pollution, escapes. Um, and there's quite a few issues um, attached to aquaculture today. Uh, and we were thinking, well, you know what? If we could influence how this sector is going to grow, how and the two thirds of the industry that today doesn't exist, how that's going to come about, then that would be a really great thing. And generally, this is an industry that's really long-term, capital intensive, like a medium-sized um, Barramundi farm yeah. that takes you like uh, 30, 40 million US dollars in equity and, um, yeah. and 10 years to build. It's a lot of money and a, and a big part of your life when you are going to build a new one, you are going to go out and talk to your colleagues and um, other people in the industry to see what the latest insights are. And if you then have two examples, now one is how you always did business with a considerable risk and a decent return, mediocre product, or better product, less risk, better future, and the same or better returns, then this is going to be your choice. So yes. what we are doing what we are doing is building, um, we said, well, how can we best influence this in this industry? And then we were thinking, well, the best way to do that, in our opinion, is to build a really large, very public global um, portfolio of aquaculture companies across the whole value chain of aquaculture, feed ingredients, farming, yes. genetics, yep. Yep. Um, disease battling, marketing and distribution, showing that you can actually have better returns if you do it in a sustainable way. Yes. And when you do it in a non-sustainable way and then build that together with a lot of entrepreneurs across the globe. We don't want to own a business. We are long-term partners. Like uh, Gibran, who you met in Indonesia, of the fishery, for example, we, it is, it, it's his and his co-founder, Krishna's uh, company. And we just want to be long-term partners and really help them grow and be at uh, the best version they can be. Um, um, and then create synergies within the portfolio. So had the feed ingredients, are going into the farming operations. The farming operations will supply the marketing and distribution operations, create a global knowledge network, work together with all the leading universities, et cetera, and really uh, make sure that we can help with anything that um, any of the partners that we uh, partner up with um, might need. Um, and then uh, the idea is to build a really large global portfolio of 60 to 80 companies worth a few billion by the end of this decade um, uh, and be really public about it, create a lot of press. Um, uh, um, and we organize events for investors to come and look and listen, like how can you do this yourself, et cetera, and do a lot of education. We are 
just launching um, our first um, aquaculture industry reports also just free for the public just um, and making sure that everybody listens or that everybody can hear it if they want to find it and at the same time make sure that um, um, we have a story that's relevant for Cargill yep. um, Evergreen in China but yep. also for a smallholder farmer in Indonesia or for a tech producer in Norway um, and that all of these parts of the value chain and the consumer um, and basically um, I can um, um, have something that's really relevant to, to them and um, I think well hey and, um, if we are going to do something in this sector we should do it like this Yes, yeah. I heard that the uh, uh, large Norwegian shipping company, uh, they are farming the fish, I mean, in fact, the salmon in the scrap ship. Because uh, their idea is that the ship, ship price of ship, second-hand price or scrap price, is, I mean, they fluctuate a lot. So uh, they want to catch the best timing of the sales, or sell, I mean, scrap the vessel, then that they, uh, they are they are growing the fish. I mean, the salmon in the, their ship. That's what I heard. All right, all right. Um, and, and we we've seen quite a few concepts um, where people are actually building ships specifically to grow mm. salmon in there. But it's uh, mm. like in general, if you look at, um, at closed systems, whether it's a ship or something else, um, to grow fish in, you have to make sure that you design it really properly. Yeah. Um, otherwise, uh, the chances of something that go that can go wrong are pretty uh, pretty high. So you need good water filtration, water treatment, um, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, and make sure that the, the fish have enough oxygen. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, what is your investment strategy and focus uh, in terms of a stage of company or the uh, yeah. like a business motor or the uh, I mean the size of size of investment, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. We, we typically, well, it needs to be relevant to aquaculture. It doesn't need to be exclusively aquaculture. It can also be something that's um, for a significant part aquaculture and then also focusing on other businesses. For example, um, we invested in a company that does um, bacteriophages as an alternative to um, antibiotics. 30% is supposed to be aquaculture, but they also do poultry and beef and humans, for example. Um, but in general, uh, we look at companies that really fix a problem in the industry mm -hmm. um, uh, or that have something unique. Um, it needs to fit in our ecosystem. So uh, we need to see a relevance in the group of companies. So uh, and that doesn't need to be today, but we need to see it in the future. Um, and then we typically invest relatively early. So not so much at the seed stage, but around the series A type stage. Sometimes a little earlier, sometimes a little later. And our initial tickets can range from anywhere between 250,000 euros to 10 million euros. But on average, okay. our initial investment is usually between three and 5 million euros. Um, and then we are long-term investors. We don't have an exit focus. Like a lot of um, uh, um, funds have, an, have a, a, a set timeline and need to exit all the underlying invest investments. We do not do that. In aquaculture, things really take time. Creating synergies in the portfolio also takes a lot of time. Um, and what we tell our companies is like, hey, if there is going to be an exit, fine. But in general, we're in it for the long term. We want to help you build your family company for the next 50 years. We don't need to get out. We'd be very happy if um, uh, five to seven years after we make our initial investment slowly, we can um, uh, um, all the shareholders can get some dividends, you, we, us, um, and then uh, keep building, which also means that we can do multiple rounds of funding. So uh, we do a Series A, but in some companies we did Series A, B, C, D, E, F. And at some point, these companies um, had then need to be able to attract capital somewhere else or not need capital anymore or go public or um, and be able to attract bank finance. But um, mm -hmm. for us, it means that we um, can um, be really long-term supporters. And um, we look for strong teams. Um, companies need to be fixing an issue. As I said earlier, they need to fit our sustainability profile. So we only invest in species that have um, a resource footprint of chicken or lower. So uh, we wouldn't invest in bluefin tuna, for example, uh, which is three times as bad as beef in terms of um, uh, um, uh, resource footprint. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And we think from a, from a sustainability perspective, that doesn't really make any sense. Um, and whether you think it's delicious or not, uh, or uh, from a conservation point of view, you think uh, you should um, be able to farm bluefin tuna could be a great business case, but it's not for us. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, so that, that's typically how we look at it. And our eventual exposure can be tens of millions. Uh, it really depends on um, uh, how the company um, and develops and um, how capital intensive the company is. You see. Yeah. Also, I saw that uh, Aquaspark invested in the insect farming business, right? Yes. Yeah. But so yeah. it is not the fish farming, uh, aquaculture. Then what is, a, no. what is the rationale behind that, I mean, for your fund? Um, as a feed ingredient. Uh, so everything. Ah, um, okay. Uh, I understood. Uh, yeah. Look at, looking at feed, uh, feed is one of the biggest issues. Yes. Um, yeah. Also from a global climate change, climate change perspective. Like, um, we think that all the bulk ingredients in fish feed today need to be replaced at some point. Mm. Um, a large part of soy and salmon feed, for example, fish meal, fish oil, which is finite. We need eight times as much. That's not going to come out of the ocean. Um, aside from the fact that the fisheries today are destructive, we think, to, a lot, to at least to a large extent. Not all of it. Um, um, uh, ideally, in the future... And, and those crops, uh, like soy, for example, uh, take up a lot of land, take up a lot of fresh water. We could use that directly for human consumption. It causes land use change in Brazil with the rainforest, for example. And in the end, that's not going to help us. And if aquaculture needs to grow threefold, that means that the aqua feed supply needs to grow eightfold. And if the aqua feed supply needs to grow eightfold, then the volume is as big as our global, global soy supply for everything. That yeah. means that we, for just fish feed, would need another North America and another Brazil somewhere. Um, we're not going to be able to find that. Now, we yeah. could do extreme GMO and genetic manipulation to get the crops to produce way more, but that's probably also not the full answer uh, or just part of the answer, if it is the answer or if it should be the answer. We've, and, and, and soy in itself is not a healthy ingredient for carnivorous fish like salmon, for example. Um, you have to do a lot of things to make sure that it's actually digestible. So we think in an ideal future, we would go to uh, we would go to new to a new system with ingredients that have a much closer relationship with the animal, like insects. Uh, if you look at chickens in uh, in the pen at home, they eat the, uh, they eat, they eat insects, for example. Um, uh, if you go salmon fishing, what do you use? You use flies. Um, and it's a very natural ingredient. You can grow it on food waste, so it doesn't have a negative footprint. It's repurposing um, what we haven't used properly and upscaling it to high um, quality protein. Um, if we can, and, and you don't need any land or fresh water for it. So yep. if you could go to ingredients like a combination of insects, single cell proteins, um, bacteria, seaweeds, microalgae, if we could can get to an economically viable feed that has those ingredients as bulk ingredients. You all of a sudden don't need um, all those land and uh, fresh water resources anymore. And you don't need um, add to um, add pillage the ocean in the same way as we do today. Um, and you have a much healthier food for your animals and we can grow a tremendous amount of food with a lower price with um, abundance, we can uh, we use all that land for direct uh, crops that we use for direct human consumption. Um, and we can grow food for 20 billion people instead of 10 billion people um, and, and live in abundance. And if you look at climate change, uh, the, the global agricultural sector is uh, good for about 30% of our global uh, um, carbon emissions. 30% of the global agricultural sector, 30% of those emissions are caused by land use change which means uh, like converting rainforest into something else for agricultural business. So a huge amount of that is soy. Yep. So uh, going, going from, uh, because a lot of people in the industry say, well, yeah, we need to um, find a replacement for fish meal, fish oil. We'll do it with plants. Oh, we're so great. It's not great. Um, and that's also not the answer, but it's uh, to find alternatives. Um, and that are really viable. We are going to need a few decades 
and trillions of dollars of investment um, opportunity to build streams that are of significant um, enough size to really have a replacement of vacant space. But that's why we invested in insects with a really long answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, COVID-19 is uh, changed a lot of things, right? Uh, changed our yeah. lives. So uh, how COVID-19 has impacted the, uh, your investment strategy approach or the paved opportunity, way for the new opportunity for you? Um, yeah, it hasn't really changed our investment approach, except for the mm-hmm. fact that it solidified our thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, and food is, is super important. Um, and um, um, healthy and clean food are the things that will keep us healthy as a human population. Um, it's, it's, if it did anything, it was fortifying what we were already doing. Um, it also made our life more difficult. It's harder to attract capital during COVID, even though now things are starting to open up again. Um, it's more difficult to make new investments because you can't, and, and to do portfolio yeah. management and work with our partners because and what we do all day is Zoom, yes, which is very yes. different from seeing each other in person. Yes. And yeah. in person, it's always different. Um, so and you can do a lot by Zoom and especially with the people that you already know for a long time. Um, but yeah, we're, we'll be very happy when it's over and then we uh, can actually go and um, see everybody again. Yeah. But we did make new investments, um, mostly in companies that we already knew. Um, and you adapt. Uh, and we use a lot of outside experts. Experts are all over the globe. So we can also make investments all over the globe, um, as we've done in the past and did last year and will do this year. So Yeah. Uh, my last question is, uh, what can you expect uh, from you and Aquaspark this year and the, your vision, long-term vision uh, for the Aquaspark? So we have about 21 companies in our portfolio today mm-hmm. and about 160 million um, AUM. And we hope to make um, between 8 and 12 new investments this year, which is quite a few. Um, we're still on track. Um, and Longer term, and from 21, we want to grow to um, uh, 60 to 70 companies, step by step. Um, and by 2030, that should have grown into um, like an AUM of around 3 billion. Um, and if that works, and we really build a public example that shows that you can do this in a different way, then uh, that was a big success. And, and along the way, we'll try to expand and, uh, and, and, and grow our story, um, grow our team, and we're now 20, that will probably grow to somewhere between 50 and 70 people in the next few years. If this keeps growing in the same way, and then see what happens. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking time and uh, introducing Aquaspark and uh, your life journey. Well, thank you, David. It was uh, really nice to have the opportunity. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, share with your friend, and drop me a review. Bye. Thank you.